Joint Town Planning and Zoning Commission, please come to order. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. Would you please stand for the pledge for the flag? bring the commission members up to speed on their terms uh, if you weren't aware of them bill he, you and brad are both up to 2026 20, dan and myself we just been renewed up to 2028 and you're a regular member now not our ordinate ordinate will be appointed later and Chris, <laughs> you're at the discretion of the, the of the of the well of the voters and the mayor and the city council. So our terms are five years, five years, yours is a year, or whatever. Or whatever. Or whatever. So thank you guys. Uh, review and approve the minutes. You should have received the minutes of June the twenty sixth, two thousand twenty. Three, is there any additions or corrections to those minutes? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I move that we Thank accept you. the minutes um, from June 26 as, as they are. Second by Bill. Any further discussion? All those approved, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, likewise. Unanimous. Thank you. Tonight's agenda. We'll start out with the 57 Bistro Station Road uh, Board of Appeal case. Ms. Aziz? Ms. Aziz? Chairman, I don't see uh, Mrs. Aziz. Um, may we move her to later in the um, okay. support that she, that she shows to get her before the. Okay. Uh, I'll go real quick, just overview of what the case is. So the, the case is for a um, special exception for a home occupation. This gal lives in Meads Crossing, and up until a month ago, uh, home occupation daycare was not um, permitted um, from our changes here. You have another viable business, and um, daycare is an extreme shortage in America. In fact, um, the governor's office is really weighing in and looking at what the lack of daycare means as far as unemployment and um, some parents not going back to the workforce, whether it be male or female. So in any case, um, she fits all the um, criteria as far as under 25% of the home. Um, she has a plan for parking. She's permitted up to eight children. I don't think that's her goal. Again, sure, hopefully she shows because if not, I don't, it's gonna be a while till we get another, um, to get her open. Um, so. You heard the plans in there, the fire plan. Uh, what looks like there's a fence fence going in. There is a fence um, a, um, application uh, in my office, or as you were down the stairs were to pick up. Okay. As of right now, no fence. All right, let's hold off on any further discussion because there's some questions I I have, and I'm sure you the rest of you have too. Yep. So we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is. Mountain Brook uh, residential development uh, presentation only. Uh, is there, you want to lead us off on that, Daryl, and then we'll get a representative to come forward? Sure. Um, so, the, again, it's the concept um, presentation, concept only. No, um, no action will be taken tonight. Um, this has been a very long, uh, um, it's, it's been in the system for quite a number of years. A lot of great engineering has gone into this, um, with it being a community village. There is a planned major roadway going through this development that's gonna be very expensive for someone to build. And um, um, I'm gonna, at this point, let you all take over. Please identify yourself and- Great, thank you. Marty Hackett, I'm president of CLSI. Um, I'm here with uh, our whole group. Um, the planner um, is Rick Hain. Uh, from KCI Technologies. We have Ms. Ridgely 
uh, here with us tonight. She's the property owner. Jacob is the uh, broker. Um, Earl Robinson, which is World Ward Properties, along with Michael Breen. And then Kevin Wingate is the uh, development consulting. Um, did I miss anyone? Um, just a quick one. This is a, a two minute history lesson. Uh, this property has been obviously in front of the council, not this sp specific council or, or uh, commission over the years. Um, it was annexed 30 some years ago um, into the town. Um, and uh, it was actually the first phase. It was preliminarily approved at one point in time, but the first phase actually ready to go under construction with the state entrance and all that stuff all permitted. And it got put on hold and uh, just fell by the wayside as far as time goes. And uh, about 10 years later, I wanna say, uh, the, the town uh, created and adopted the uh, community village ordinance, which allowed for some innovative designs and creativity in their designs instead of just your normal Euclidean conventional zone cookie cutter type lots. And uh, we're here today, I know it's been in front of you, uh, even with other designs of that. Uh, Mr. Hain is here um, to take really take over the presentation. He's the land planner uh, to go through the process on how he came up with the plan. So I want to turn it over to him and then we're gonna just open up for any questions that everybody might have. Thank you. Hi there, how are you? Bruce Hain from the Practice Center for Planning and Landscape Architecture for Geodetic Technology. Based out of Clarks, Maryland, and um, so I guess first I'm just going to say, um, you know, why was I brought in to the project? Um, you know, basically the community village um, ordinance is, you know, it's a tool, if you will, a land planning tool to help, you know, raise the level of the design of the project. That's the way I look at it, and if you look at uh, you know, the community village ordinance, there's a there's a description in the purpose and intent. Um, it says it is to further purpose of this section to encourage the integrated and creative design of a variety of land uses and housing types to maximize and plan for open space and preserve natural features. And that's really what we're doing with this project. Um, and I, so I just wanted to take a minute to sort of walk you through the thought process that we went through to design the project. Um, and I think that you can see me pretty well. Can you see my cursor moving around in front of you? I can. Okay. So this is just an orientation map. I, th I think you all know where the property is, but uh, you know, the, this is the outline of the property here. Um, and this is kind of a multi-purpose exhibit. I wanted to speak to Antrim Boulevard, which is the master plan roadway going through the property, um, and then talk about you know, the, the environmental features and then some of the adjacent land uses and how that sort of, you know, dictated how we might approach this planning process. Mm -hmm. So um, to begin with, uh, you know, these, these diagrams up here in the upper right are from, you know, the Tawny Town Comprehensive Plan and the um, Carroll County Plan. And on both documents, there's, there's a plan, master plan roadway that, Trev, you know, goes through our property. And, you know, when we were meeting with uh, the city, you know, they had, the plan was, okay, if you wanna come in and build this with the community village ordinance, you need to not only dedicate the, the land for the um, master plan road, but build the road. So there's a, there's a pretty big expense um, associated with that. And, um, and so, you know, that was one of the reasons um, the complex nature of why we're brought in to sort of create a vision for this. And so if you look at uh, this, this alignment here is the proposed um, alignment that we're showing for Antrim Boulevard. It's a 90 foot right of way. It's a pretty large roadway. Um, and, you know, we're trying to keep it fairly simple and come up through, we get access down here um, on Francis Scott Key Highway. And then we, we cross this floodplain here at the narrowest point. Then we're gonna swing the roadway over to the Western property line. And then it, for our purposes, it's gonna terminate here at the Northern end of the property. But um, you know, once it gets there, then there are planned connections to take it both you know, West and North, uh, according to these master plans. So, um, so the road is one aspect that we need to deal with in the, in the project. Um, 
But then part of the, the ordinance for a community village is to really recognize all the environmental features that are on the property. And so there's a rather large floodplain um, stream system, wetland system, that you know, splits the property in half. That's located right here. And then there are a number of other um, you know, systems that feed into that, whether there's swales and wetland fingers that come through here. Um, and that's, I'm demonstrating that um, with all these light blue areas. So right off the top between, you know, the master plan roadway and these environmental areas, there's, there's a lot of land that's really not buildable. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's part of our issue um, for going with the community village discussion um, so that we can, you know, use it as a planning tool. Uh, so then before we actually started designing anything and, and really placing buildings out in the property, we wanted to look at the adjacent land uses and, and help those land uses guide where we would put certain types of units. So at, to the north, um, to the north side of the property, there's zone industrial, and then uh, there's the, the Tawny Town Memorial Park along the eastern boundary. This is, this is zoned open space here. Um, and then, you know, we have the, the, um, the existing business districts that are located along Francis Scott Key Highway. So there's, there's, there's a lot of, you know, uses in here between the business district and the industrial that, you know, ideally you won't let, you don't want to put your housing immediately adjacent to it if you had a choice. Um, so what we did is we started thinking about, and our proposed mix within this, um, Use, utilizing the community village um, ordinance is to supplement the single family, which would be allowed under the underlying zoning with townhomes. Um, and where we would like to put those townhomes is demonstrated with these colored, you know, blobs, if you will, the really land base. So um, against this in existing industrial, you know, we thought this would be a good location for the townhomes because it basically creates a buffer between the single family homes and the industrial. Um, and then when you look at the, um, the parks, the parkland and zoned open space, well, that's an ideal location for single family homes. So that's where we would like to put that. And then down here along um, uh, Francis Scott Key Highway, you know, there's a lot of this business zoning. And again, we're gonna buffer these single families from this um, townhome groups here. And then further to the west, there are some small pockets of townhomes. One of the things that Ward Homes, who's, a, who's the uh, applicant here, they did not want to see um, residents um, who um, the single family owners driving through townhouse community to get to, their, um, to the, get to their home. So that's why you see these townhome pockets over here. So um, that's kind of just a basic line of thinking before we actually started uh, drawing anything. And of course my computer's not working. So let's see if I can get out of this for a second. Nope. Oh, there we go. Let's see if I can get. Okay, so there was slide number one. There we go. So the next thing we did was actually start, you know, designing the project. And if you look at this basic diagram, you're gonna see those land uses, just as we talked about where we have townhouses up against this industrial, we have single family homes up against the parkland. Uh, we have townhomes located here next to the business district. Um, so when we look at how we would like to there's some pretty cool ingredients actually in the plan that you might not know um, by looking at it, but I'd like to explain some of the things that we're doing in here that actually increases the level of the design. So the, the Antrim Boulevard, again, is a very wide road section. And what we, and it's going to probably have eventually, if these connections are made, it's gonna relieve all the traffic from the downtown area. And it'll, it'll probably have pretty good, um, traffic on it, with, which includes trucks. So um, we didn't really want, we wanted to do two things. One thing we didn't want to do was back out homes to the large Antrim Boulevard 
to sort of create, you know, then, it, then all of a sudden you have to do all the screening and uh, berming. And we what we really wanted to do is from day one, when you're driving down Antrim Boulevard, that these homes present the front of their homes so that the public view of the project is the very best view you could possibly have. You're looking at the front of the homes. And how do we accomplish that? So we, we did that um, a couple ways with the townhouse groups, like for instance here, these are alley loaded townhomes. So, you know, the alleys are located back here and the, the front of the units face Antrim Boulevard. Uh, likewise, for the single family homes, um, we're not backing these homes to Antrim Boulevard, but we're fronting them. And they get access from a little private driveway that's parallel to Antrim Boulevard. So what we're looking for are, you know, typical relationships that you'd like to see so that these single family homes that are located here are back to back. We're not backing any of the units out to Antrim Boulevard. Um, this townhouse group here, these are all rear loaded townhomes again, so they all face Antrim Boulevard. Um, the other thing that we're doing with that is that we are, we're creating a self-imposed 50 foot setback to Antrim Boulevard from the right of way. So there's not going to be any units or roads any closer than 50 feet um, along Antrim Boulevard. And what that does is it basically creates a linear park system right through the middle of the project. So there's ample room there with 50 foot of feet on either side of the road. We can put trails in there. We can put bike trails. We can uh, we could get um, you know a sidewalk system through there. So it's going to be you know we'll basically it really it will be a linear park system that goes right to the middle of the project. Um, and then to um, so that's the, that's sort of some cool things that we're doing in terms of how to deal with Antrim Boulevard. Then from a just more of a land planning sense, you know, what we like to do with projects like this, they're, they're more like cluster subdivisions. We try to save as much of the environmental land and open space as we can, and then cluster the, how, the homes, either they back up to open space or they front onto open space. So if you look at these little neighborhoods in here, um, you know, here's a pocket, or I'll call it a neighborhood of, of single family homes. Um, well, they have a green space uh, in the middle of it. So they're gonna, they're gonna be, you know, they have good rear yard space, but they also have a front door, which is gonna be very attractive um, with a nice green out in the front. You know, here's another neighborhood and there's another neighborhood green that's gonna be there. Um, and, and there's a lot of environmental area in here that creates great home sites. Um, there's a big, there's, we're planning a community park in this location, which I'll get into a, a little bit more detail. But there will be convenient parking in here. Um, there's going to be there's an existing farm pond right here that'll be preserved. Uh, there's a natural draw going down to that pond that we're proposing an informal amphitheater, and uh, and a lot of open space. So um, that is, and and I'm pre prefacing this is that this is actually our process. This is the first plan that we came in and talked to the city about. It's not the plan, which I'll get into later, which is the concept plan um, that we're, um, which is part of the application, but it's a process. There's a slight revision that we made to it. Um, so this, this plan actually is an open space diagram. So it, you know, the building sites here are ghosted in white and all the different types of open space that are within the project are identified. So this sort of rusty salmon color in here, that's, um, you know, this is the, the environmental land. So this is the, the floodplain wetlands and these fingers that come through here, those are all being preserved. Well, they all have buffers on them as well. Um, and then, um, so then there's a different types. This is environmental land. We're calling this um, community open space. And then there's common open space. And so if you look at the plan, um, there's an awful lot of, of open space. Can you help me with the difference between community and common open space? Sure. Um, community open space in, in, for this purpose is what I'm calling that front door open space. So this color green, as you see it, like this one here, this one here, that's the front door. So basically, if you're looking out the front of your house, you're going to be looking at community open space. Um, and then the common open space is typically found in the rear but it's not on a lot, 
So it's still common. Common data. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. So, um, and then within that, you know, we're, we're proposing a lot of amenities. So, um, so within that, this community park space, there's going to be parking. Uh, we're proposing uh, picnic pavilions and uh, places for people to gather. A trail system will be going throughout the entire project, connecting all the neighborhoods. And like I said, there's an informal amphitheater that's going to be up against this farm pond and a playground. So, uh, you know, what, what this ordinance allows us to do, rather than the base zoning where everything is lotted off and you have very little open space, um, this, this allows us to do this clustering um, to help create really much better open space for the entire community as a, at a whole. Um, and then this diagram was produced to demonstrate, you know, the amount of land area that has been dedicated to the single family homes versus the townhomes. So the townhomes again are this darker brown color um, and the, the single family homes are this uh, tan color. And you can tell just from looking at it that there's more, more land area dedicated to the single family than the townhomes. We actually have the percentages on there. It's about 65, 35 in terms of the actual land area that's dedicated to the to the housing types. So this is where, you know, we, we met with, um, with Jim and Daryl a number of times to, you know, help our way through this process. And during one of those meetings, um, you know, they brought it to our attention that um, the Rec and Parks Department within the, the city it was interested in acquiring some land um, for the project to expand uh, Memorial Park. So, um, you know, so I think, you know, as a team and as the, the applicant, um, you know, we're all here to try to, to have a successful project for everyone. So we're totally open to that idea. Um, you know, so let's, you know, so we we're, we're engaging that idea and it's now part of the project. So we're um, basically giving up five acres of open space that will be dedicated over to the city to expand the, the uh, ball fields at Memorial Park. Um, and that, that little revision in here is the only difference between the first set of documents that I showed you and this one. Um, so we're dedicating this five acres here, uh, shortening up this cul-de-sac. It used to come all the way back into here. Um, and then we're just pulling a few of these townhomes down here along this edge and other than that, there are really no revisions based other than the plan that I just shared with you. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these diagrams are gonna be a little bit redundant, um, but by doing that, we've actually now even increased the open space even more within the project. So um, with this five acre addition in here, um, we're, and all these different open space types, we've done the calculations and we're looking at um, percentage-wise 49.995% open space within the project. So it's nearly 50% green, um, which is, this is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty ideal living situation where, you know, you're, you're living in a 50% um, uh, green community. And that again is, is a, it's, we're being able to do that by utilizing this ordinance. Um, and you know, what, what I did is I've done a lot of, um, I've been around for a while. You can tell from the, the, the gray hair. So, you know, I, we approached this plan from like our experience of how we would like to see the project be built. Um, and so that's how we designed it. It was like, okay, let's not just, when they brought me in, it wasn't so much about we want you to do everything about that you see in that village ordinance. It was more like, give us a vision for what this community could really be. And that was really our guiding principle for where we are, where we are now. And then the last diagrams in here are basically illustrating how the project would get phased. I mean, this is overall, it's a large project, but, um, you know, it's gonna have absorption rates of like maybe around 30, on average, 36 homes per year. 
So if you're talking about phasing a project like this, it's you're talking about a very long build out for the project. So, you know, the density wise, it's just going to get picked at like a little bit every year. It's not like it's all going to get built at once and there's going to be a big change. So, um, you know, basically this diagram, um, it's it's we split it up into four phases. We're calling the the southern half of the project phase one, which is split up between 1A and 1B, and the northern half is, is 2A and 2B. So in, and then the other thing is that, um, you know, if we, if we get the approval to proceed, it's gonna be nearly three years between when we started this process, which was back in March, until we would actually have building permits and start building. So, you know, we got a lot of approval process to get through before you're ever gonna see a shovel go into the ground. So phase one, 1A, wouldn't really start until December of 2026. And then it would be built out over a 27 month period, um, two years and three months to, to deliver this first phase, which is, which, which is ideal really, because what it does is it, it gets us up front um, the first phase of Antrim Boulevard, we, we would build that um, from Francis Scott Key up to the floodplain line. And then it delivers all three of the built, proposed building types. So we have um, front loaded townhomes, which are located around the perimeter. And we're, we're proposing front loaded townhomes in locations where it makes sense, right? They're backing up to an environmental area um, or they're backing up to the boundary line. So it makes, doesn't make any sense to be doing alleys when they're single loaded and backing up to an open space. But where we have the opportunity or where we're using it as a land planning tool, like, like we are to face the homes out onto um, Antrim Boulevard, we, we're proposing that those be alley loaded townhomes. So there's a, there's a, a cluster of those that are located inside here. Um, so, Again, to build out the first phase, which is gonna be 141 units, it's gonna be over two years. And you're, you're, the end result, we're, we're now reaching out into March of 2029 by the time phase 1A is complete. And then this is just gonna show you in a time frame over time, how long it's gonna take this to build out. So then we move on to phase 1B. Um, and actually, if I go back to phase 1A, let me just point out that the, the delivery of this park, five acre parkland, um, that would be delivered in phase 1A after um, they close on the property. So this would be a public benefit that would be very early in the project. Um, and then in 1B, um, and these actually phases 1A and 1B are very similar in the amount of density. So they're very similar in the time frame for the build out. So you're looking at another two years and three months to build out phase 1B. And uh, what would happen at, at the end of 1B, we would be planning this Antrim Boulevard design from the very beginning, um, but we would start the construction of, to get to phase two, because we have to cross this uh, floodplain right in here. So that would occur near the end of phase 1B. And then, um, then we, once we're across the floodplain, then the commitment would be we would complete um, the construction of Antrim Boulevard. So that would be not be delayed. Um, it would be built out first thing as we get into crossing the floodplain. Um, and then the, the north side, as you can see, just from the land areas is a smaller you know, size of the project. So we're looking at you know, a little over 100 units in 2A um, and that would have a build out of about you know, close to two years. And then lastly, um, we would finish up the project with phase 2B um, and there's, there's only 64 units um, proposed in B. So that'd take a little over a year. Um, but the point about showing this phasing really is that, you know, there might be a, a perception of a, of a big project here, but if you look at it, the way it's gonna be taken down, it's actually gonna be taken down in very small increments. Um, and so the impact is gonna be like over many, many years. So between, like I said, we started working on this from a concept stage in March 
until we would actually be doing closeout documents for the project. You're looking at a time frame um, of almost 12 and a half years um, for it to be completed. So it's a, you know, it's it's not like um, all the units are coming tomorrow. Is my point. Um, so that is uh, really the overview of the project for tonight. So we're here otherwise to answer any questions that you might have. Just maybe so the public has aware of the size of this. Can you tell us how many acres is involved? How much is is green land? How many units with singles and townhouses? Yep. And I guess my last question, is there any running water through that property? Is there any and running water? Water like any streams or is it just inlets? Well, I believe there's a running stream through here. It's called Piney Creek, right? Okay. Piney Creek goes okay. through here. Okay. So there's a running stream through here, but there's also a wetland and floodplain system. So it's a pretty wide, you know, cross section through this area. Um, and so to look at the numbers, okay, so. Um, so the public that is not here. Sure, I understand, yeah. I, I, I wanted to show you the, the phasing before we got into the hard numbers. Um, so the, the overall site area is, is 167 acres, of which there's this, uh, you know, part of this project, this is part of the property, but it's actually zoned general business district. So the, what we're calling the net site area after you subtract out that business district is around 160 acres in total. Um, and then we are, you know, the density that's allowed um, under the community village ordinance for R10, which is the base zoning, um, there are two different density calculations that you can use. One is the standard density method. So using our, um, our net site area, the, the base density allowed under the uh, ordinance is times 2.8, which would allow 449 density units. And then there's a conditional density units um, ordinance um, where you can go up to four units um, times the net acreage, and that would be up to a total of 642 units. And we are like basically just a few units over the standard density count. So if you look at these calculations over here, um, we split it up. Um, so if you're looking at what was phases 1A and 1B, um, there's a total of 281 units. Um, and then north of the, the floodplain area, which is 2A and 2B, um, there's 173 units. And then, so that makes a, we, a combined density, a proposed density of 454 units, but like I said, which is just a few units over the, the standard density calculation, which is allowed over the community village. Um, so it, it would, you know, I guess, throw us into the conditional density category by a few units. Um, and so um, those are the, uh, the density numbers. And then this page is, gives you a little more detail um, on those, the open space numbers. So again, we have you know, over 30 acres of environmental open space. We had the Memorial Park expansion of five acres, uh, community open space, which I described, uh, which is that front door open space. And then the common open space, which is not lotted or, and is not in an environmental area, but it's part of the open space system. Um, that's, that's another 12 acres. And then we're, there's gonna be stormwater management, obviously, those are typically gonna be butting up against a lot of these environmental areas before um, we release. So again, do we add that up? There's, there's 78 acres of proposed open space out of a 160 acre net project. Um, so we're almost completely at 50% open space um, for the project. And uh, and then these were some typical lots, just so you wanted to know what the different housing types are. Um, these are the alley loaded townhomes, which are 20 foot wide by 44 foot deep. Um, and then they would be loaded from the rear to the alley. And um, you know they would have a street out front. Uh, this could be Antrim Boulevard or, or another street. And then the front loaded townhomes are um, 22 foot wide by 40 foot deep. Um, and there's a 25 foot um, driveway apron out to the right of way line, which allows plenty of parking um, opportunity in front of those townhomes. And then similarly, the single family units are, um, are 
135 foot deep and, um, and they're about um, 75 foot wide. And so, um, so those are some of our typical lot diagrams. And again, you can see that overall in the project, um, we have a developable area. Um, again, that's taking out all that, n that net um, open space area of about 107 acres out of the, um, out of the total 160. So we're looking at um, a land area dedication for 62% of the land of the buildable land area is dedicated to single family and 40% is, is dedicated to, or 37.8% is dedicated to the town homes. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Okay, next we'll hear, hear from Phil Freeze and then after that, we'll go to the first question. Phil Freeze. A couple of questions that um, rang in right off the top. Um, your phase timing, um, I, I assume you're open to shortening those phase timings if uh, if the market allows? Yeah. It's really a question for the builder, but I would assume yes, that the sales pace goes faster, yes. I would assume, no, I'm, yeah. yeah. Taking the example of Meads Crossing where they built yep. and sold 330 townhouses in three years, or 330 houses yeah. in three years. I, you know, it, it was a, a shortage of lumber there for a while in 2020, and I think it's because it was all over over here. Um, so it, that, I just think that that may, given the marketplace it and, could the, and the, the based on averages, yes. So, but yeah. they're they're certainly open to speeding that up. Um, uh, the front loaded townhouses. My understanding is, and we just went through a big uh, to do uh, with the uh, community village ordinance. And uh, our front-loaded townhouses, and, and I'm looking at you, Mr. Wafrick, and Mr. Hale, uh, are you know our front-loaded townhouses allowed? I didn't think they were allowed under the current ordinance. So what would we, how would we handle that? So the big change with Community Village that was passed last month was to um, remove the alley requirement for the single-family detached dwellings and to leave the commission the flexibility it already has regarding the townhouses. So um, it has been demonstrated previously um, that alleys, even, even on projects where alleys were going to be required, that alleys weren't gonna be required, for example, along the perimeter or where there was an environmental feature that, that where the alley would only serve one side of, of the townhomes. So we've kind of set that precedent previously. Um, but the code, the existing code gives some latitude on the, the townhouse alleys already. So this, this does satisfy the code. And that'll be part of the zoning administrator's review when we get to that, that point as well. Uh, just two more quick questions. Um, the, the main road through the middle of the project, um, and, and I'm, I'm happy to see that you understand what that road will be and what the intention of it is. Uh, and there have been discussions where it's possible it may end up being turned over to the state and become a state road. Have you factored in the um, necessary roadway sections uh, so that if, if, if that does become a, uh, become a reality later on, have we factored in that that, that roadway section has been factored into your computations as it were for uh, expenditures? So you, you know what you know what you're getting into you know what you're buying. Correct. We had we had meetings with uh, Mr. Hale and Mr. Weeprick, and uh, they they mentioned that that may be an opportunity uh, that the town be looking for. So uh, we are analyzing what that is and how that roadway is going to be constructed, whether it's going to be a closed section road or open section like Antrim is now, yeah. uh, because they're still going to have to have stormwater management, and all the other related stuff. Right. And and those are discussions that that will continue to happen with the state. Cause we you know open section versus closed section and, and all of that. Correct. Um, I kind of think we're going to end up with closed section anyway in order to get your linear park idea and your trails on either side. You, you know, you may want to keep, because that way you don't have to have the swales and stuff. Um, the existing farm structures that are on the property, I've never been back there. I have no idea what, what the houses and barns look like. Is there any way of uh, keeping those uh, for historical sake, as it were, or are they kind of in the highest, best uses as a, a tinder? 
Yeah, but we're proposing uh, as part of this plan that that, that they would be demoed there. Uh, they don't uh, appear to be have any intrinsic historic value or be on a list somewhere. Um, but that is the intention that they would be demoed and they're basically located right, right around here. Um, and that's basically right where we're proposing a community park. I'm good. Yep, sure. Okay. Um, appreciate you going through your thought process uh, um, on it, how you're gonna how you lay this out. Um, and uh, the I was really curious on how the main road was going to be. So uh, you described uh, described that pretty well. I do have a, a few concerns though with uh, well one like all the other roads. What's the thought process for your width and parking on the the roads throughout the development? Um, we have at this stage, all of that has not been, you know, totally planned. But we're, you know, the way that this is designed, for the most part, is that we'd like to keep the road sections for the neighborhood streets um, as narrow as possible. Um, that would be allowed, um, and we would do that for primarily for environmental reasons, so that we can, you know, as soon as you keep adding more pavement to the project, you know, you're going to have. Yeah. Higher heat index, lower, you know, more runoff, more stormwater. Right. So, um, the narrowest possible road section. And my my would... concern is I'd rather have the widest possible. Um, so uh, the reason being is for uh, basically fire access. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I think what you have out at uh, um, the retirement village is too narrow. I think what you have at Carol Vista is too narrow. I think what you have at Meads is too narrow. Um, I think uh, the road like. Well, actually, the road that I live on, Roth Avenue, is probably like the minimum. So there's parking on both sides, and there's still mm -hmm. access for uh, uh, fire equipment. Um, so that's one concern that I have. Uh, the other one is when you start building your main uh, boulevard through there, um, it looks like you're going to have a single point of access to the development for a long time. Uh, so I don't know what the plan is to, to take it. I mean, obviously, it's not going to go straight through right away. Right. And which would be the best, uh, but, uh -huh. but if you had an incident in the back uh, of the, even the first section of your development and the, the front got blocked, uh, fire access would be very difficult. Yeah, we will be, uh, we will be doing a traffic study and working with traffic engineers to specifically look at that design. Um, there are ways to stand the boulevard by the third entrance to where we would widen it out slightly to where it would take one, it'd take obviously a large accident to block the whole thing. Mm -hmm. to, uh, room to have two lanes back in there. Sure. Now, the other thing would be is there's other road frontage there that would give us maybe an opportunity to put a emergency access on each lane. Mm -hmm. um, for that. So if there was an accident blocking the one, we had that as an alternative. Just to put that there. Yep. Is it because I mean, I guess something in, in, in the past is, I mean, I was really conscious about, I mean, you're talking about phase uh, 1A and 1B, roughly 240 some homes. We usually look at more than one egress with anything over 50. So we, when you mentioned about an emergency uh, street, road, or something temporarily to make another means in other, off of, other than off of 194, then that, I think that's something you need to look at up front. Yep. That's just way too many homes to come in off of one spot. Yep. Mr. Parker, yeah. we we. Definitely plan on looking at that, and we would probably set that up as being a secondary access for emergency that would be focused Agreed. on that, yes. but try to keep the boulevard as the main entrance and, and use that as the ingress egress to the community. Um, and you know, they certainly we've done them in the past where they're they're safe that way, but we understand that second means. And of course, once the road does go through, but I know it's gonna be a long time, you know, it's gonna be some years that you know there there will be obviously more means of access to that area. 12 years is not a long time when you're concerned we've been talking about this for 30. Right. <laughs> I understand that too. So, yep. glad to see some progress. So, good. Dan, go ahead. Uh, okay for right now. Um, Bill. I think the most important part is I think you addressed mo a lot of it. I think that Antrim Boulevard is very important to this town. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to put a lot of thought for the citizens that already live here. Yep. not the people that are moving into this. I've lived here for 38 years. We've been talking about this for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do, and I appreciate it, and everybody else here appreciates the thought that you put in, in place 
to go with that development. So, yeah, I, I agree with Bill. I, there's that is this shows a tremendous amount of thought and planning, and and a desire to really work within uh, the bounds of the natural environment and and trying to. Um, you know, make it fit to the to the what's naturally there instead of of uh, moving nature around to fit your needs. Right. Um, and and I, I'm I saw this plan a few months ago, and I was very excited when I saw it, and I'm still excited. Thank you. And open space. I mean, that's, that's yeah, that's nice. To have. Pretty impressive. How do you get yeah. not excited about that? That's yeah. just uh, yeah. from a planning standpoint, it just doesn't get any better. Okay. Yeah. And I'm good. Before I open up just to the floor, uh, Jim or Daryl. Where do we stand on the water and sewer? I mean, somebody's, I mean, uh, someone's always asking about that, so I'd like to have something up front. Right, so we're making good headway on the sewer capacity issue. We've, we've done a number of um, I, I remediation projects. We've um, replaced and relined um, a substantial portion of the line, the sewer main by the Tawnytown Taun Elementary School that knocked down our I and I numbers dramatically. Uh, we've also finished um, replacing segments and relining other segments of the Meadowbrook interceptor that carries a large portion of the flow from town um, to the York Street pumping station. And again, seen very significant decreases in wet weather flows from that project. And we've also hit um, segments of Fairground Avenue uh, with, with some sewer rehab and relining. Um, you know, those have, have taken us from where we would go into, uh, like, there are like two levels of storm modes at the treatment plant, and we've seen rainfalls since we've had these projects in, in the ground now that, that the rainfall would have put the plant over, over a million gallons a day of flow, um, and we're, we've seen, um, like, rains that would push us there are only flowing at like 600,000 gallons now. So uh, we, it looks like we picked some really good projects to be our first rehab projects. Um, we have, we're also of course working on Broad Street and Roberts Mill Road and the sewer in the, both of those streets is, is old terracotta sewer. So, and at the base of Broad Street, there's a sewer manhole that has been known to surcharge during heavy rains. So we know we have a lot of I and I inflow and infiltration in, in the system leading down to that manhole. So this project should, it may not be as dramatic of a reduction as the others because they were also right next to water courses. <laughs> um, but we expect to see further improvement when Broad Street and Roberts Mill Road sewer is redone as part of that kind of mini streetscape we're doing. Um, and we have projects scape scheduled for next year as well. So the sewer is moving along very well. Uh, water, we are going to need to acquire recharge acreage. Um, and we've kind of gone back and forth with the county a little bit. They're willing to assist us with some recharge for properties that they have under ag preservation where the county ag easements have a recharge easement component and the county's willing to dedicate some of that to us. And that will help ease what the state considers our recharge deficit on the water side, but it's not gonna be enough to provide water for a project like this. We are aware of a couple farms within our, our watershed or our aquifer that have been approached and we're interested in selling recharge easements and we're gonna have to pick those conversations back up to be able to attribute recharge to some of our existing wells. So we have the capacity to pump more water, but regulation wise, we're not allowed to because we can't count water recharge that doesn't occur within the city limits or our own property that we control, that we have an easement on. So we, we need to get those recharge easements and start those conversations up so that by the time this project is ready for the first phase, we will have the water available. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Okay. Another quick and question. Rick, would, could you uh, show you the stormwater management uh, slide that you had there? You had the, uh, yeah. shows the, uh, the the nice blue, uh, yeah. So, so everywhere it's blue there is uh, basically a, a stormwater management pond. I mean, right? it's this is very preliminary. We're basically identifying where the stormwater management would likely go. Okay, it's not designed. The areas are not 
completely accurate. It's just if we're where we'd put stormwater, it would be in those locations. Yeah. So, so and my my concern is that if you drive around sometimes and they uh, after the years they become overgrown and it really doesn't usually doesn't look very nice in the area. So I don't I don't know. If, I don't know what can be done about that. I don't know if a, the town mows it or the homeowners association mows it or whatever, but uh, some of them get pretty uh, pretty nasty looking and uh, smell pretty bad if there's water laying in there. Ever. That's going to fall on Marty. Yeah. Most of them will not be a wet pond. Mm -hmm. They may be a, a submerged gravel wetland, um, so they will hold water for a duration and then, and then basically infiltrate. Um, the days that you see wet ponds, and I do have a couple of my stormwater management guys here, they'll correct me if I'm wrong, trust me. Um, but they, it's so the, the bottom line, some of the stuff may be underground, mm -hmm. and some of them may be submerged gravel wet, gotcha. um, maybe some bio areas and stuff. There's some changes to, obviously, stormwater over the years that have changed the way they look. Uh, your submerged gravel wetlands are still landscaped and all that stuff. They have, uh, you know, aquatic plants and all that, um, along with your bioretention areas and so on. So they look a little different. Um, whether they're gonna be publicly maintained or privately maintained, we're surely, I'm gonna have, we're gonna have a lot of discussion mm -hmm. through the preliminary plan review and all that, I'm sure. Um, it's, it, it's, it's overall, it's a large project and we wanna plan it right. We wanna design it right. So cool. we'll, we'll be having lots of discussion, I'm sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any comments from the floor? If you do, please come up to the podium, please. Folks, this is your opportunity. Now's the time we want to hear it. Speak up. All right, well, with that, all right. I know you didn't want to be the first one, right? I'm Terry Mead. I'm on Bomb Gardner. Um, I have a question on the traffic for this. Um, you guys already kind of talked about the fact that it's pretty much only coming out one side for a good chunk of this. And also it's just coming out onto 194 there. And even when you get the connector up to 140, anybody that's headed to Baltimore is going through downtown. Either way, either up through 194 and, and turn right, or, or 140 and across. What what are we doing to 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 mitigate some of that problem? Because I mean, I've I've been backed up into the farmlands <laughs> on 194 coming home, uh, and some of the same on uh, coming in uh, westbound on 140 in the afternoon. So what, what, what are we doing on that front? Did, did you say, Marty, that there were gonna be a traffic study? There, we will okay. we'll be doing a traffic study. Ultimately, this is a large segment of the planned major street. The entire puzzle is not gonna get put together until other properties are going to provide the larger area. But you would answer both of all the three questions. The, the one segment that goes through the snow pit plant would, would be obviously fabulous as a site plan condition of that road and their serving and all their stuff massive the the back segment of going from 194 over to 140 we'll be working with the traffic department but that alone will certainly assist the truck traffic so if you're heading toward Pawneetown or 194 from Frederick making a right hand turn and well any right hand turn movement like that square is difficult guys that's where you're going mm -hmm. so this road allows you to make a left, go out to 140 on a modernized intersect, and then turn right and go straight on through the intersect and have, have to deal. And that, that situation can occur, if you think about it, at all four locations. Meaning if they're going toward Hanover, and they were supposed to turn down here and go turn right, in that case, you're turning left. Left-hand turn movement is not as bad as the right, where you're up against a curb cut. I'm not your traffic inspector, but I've spent enough of them to understand. And we will be going through the whole process and reviewing it with the town engineer too, and we'll check on all that stuff. Are we combining them with the Sewers Farm traffic uh, traffic study that's going to be going on to, to see what the combined? Uh, we'll, we'll provide that. It's difficult to answer that question at this time. Uh, Sewers Farm um, 
Generally, we'll feed out into a different location uh, in the way that it's currently planned. Um, there is a possibility that it may tie into the end of, of this through the, uh, through the bean property. Again, these are all preliminary things that we're talking about, and none of this is set in stone, but we are looking at alternate methods for getting traffic through on the low side between this development and Antrim Boulevard. Uh, the, the, the county and the city already own property uh, for construction of, of, of a continuation of Antrim Boulevard, and we are, you know, there are discussions in the works for the rest of it. So it has, this is a piece of the puzzle, and, and it's one of those things that we took to the State Highway Administration about a month ago uh, and had a meeting with them and, and, and said, hey, you know, we're serious about this. We, we want this road back on, on the transportation master plan because we're, you know, if we have to build it ourselves, we're gonna build it ourselves, it may take a little longer, but it's gonna happen because it has to happen. Yeah, because I mean, basically, I'm just, from looking at both both projects, we basically have 10 years of traffic feeding onto 194. Yeah. <laughs> that, and it's all going through, even if you come up and around and through, it's all going through the square. That's a disadvantage of having two major highways in the center of town. <laughs> well, but we're adding it, how many thousand right. more people <laughs> to to that? Right. Not just the choice. Your, just your the concern is well noted, <laughs> and it, and and we are studying that. Yeah. We absolutely are. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chris, for your input. I was going to say, that. yeah, because I know, I know the bypasses have been talked about for a very long time. <laughs> we are working with the county and yep. the state to get it back on the transportation master plan. Just, just hoping we don't put the cart before the horse. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I'm not hearing anything from the commission, uh, we thank you, folks. Thank you for thank your time. You. I appreciate your time. Future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We need to gather up. <coughs> move on then to the Project 180. Uh, representative wanted to come, come up front. And there, or somebody want to lead us off on that? We're here just for a grading uh, preliminary site plan for grading only. Okay. All right. Start off. So um, <clears throat> there's been a good bit of progress running through the uh, grading um, uh, portion of the um, of this project. Again, this is for the parking lot, the stormwater management, um, and they've been awesome. Just throwing out there the, the realignment uh, land needed for down the road for Harney Road and, and 140. That's awesome. Really appreciate it. So they were just simply asked, and they they jumped at it. So saying that, we're looking at the outside. Nothing on the inside of the building, but the parking lot, stormwater management, and getting some type of easement, what have you, for that partial land, portion of land. And so um, they have a number of um, approval letters. The one letter that I don't have with me, as you were, that don't have is the one from CDM Smith for their final approval for the um, for the stormwater management, but I have gotten things from the county saying that advisory approval, um, um, grading plan and review exempt. But again, we still need CDM Smith's um, letter or so uh, of approval or acceptance. Do so, we expect that anytime? Um, yes, uh, why as you were. I will contact them tomorrow. Okay. Um, it, it, I hope it's not buried in my machine someplace, but so with the county, sometimes CDM Smith is included or CC'd on the letter um, or an email, and sometimes they're not. And so the last two letters that I got, CDM Smith was not included for their review. And so if, if there is an approval, it would be contingent upon CDM Smith's approval. Right. Um, but from the county standpoint, they're, they're pretty well there. Okay. Gentlemen? Gentlemen, you wanna lead it off here on Basically, we're here tonight to answer any questions. I think we went through the process or you talked about what the uh, project is. 
Uh, we're hoping to at least get conditional approval so we can move to the finals with CDM, condition of what they come up with. Um, the biggest thing, if any, have anything is going to be stormwater, but it's actually a pretty simple design. Um, so we're hoping they have minimal or no comments, but whatever they have, we'll address, take care of. But we'd like to try and keep the project moving forward because they have some deadlines for their grants and things like that that we're trying to hit to keep this thing moving. Okay. Okay. So, so, sir, you're looking for preliminary contingent upon CDM Smith. And, Correct. Okay. And I did talk to Jim about how we're going to dedicate that road once we have all the comments and make sure it's not going to move. We're going to prepare an um, exhibit with the meets and bounds and then nice. the attorney can take care of the rest. Good. Thank you. And the easement part is all squared away then, right? Well, we'll, That's we'll what be. I was just talking about. That's, it. it will be once once they're good or golden. Okay. Yeah. It's it's shown on the preliminary yeah. plan, but we just want to make sure that it's not going to change before we ask the attorney to put the description in the, I mean, CLSI will give us the description. The attorney will plug it into our, our easement format. Um, but we just want to make sure that, that nothing is going to change before we take that step. Okay. That'll be so part of the final, that's, that's why the final stage. But it is okay. on the plans. Yeah. Okay. All right. And... Uh, after looking at the plans, uh, the only thing I could see on the plans that I was concerned with, I, I didn't see any parking lot lights in the parking lot. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're are they, are they on the plans? No, there are uh, spotlights on both buildings, but no actual built-in parking lots. Yeah. Uh, Yet on your cut sheet, it shows a, 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 a pole light. So what's the pole light go to? We're not proposing any lighting. So all the lights will be on the existing building, hitting the parking lot 24, I mean, all night, or going to be on timers, or uh, are we have any neighbors that can be concerned about? Uh, no, if it's going to be across the neighbors, and we will put them on a timer to have them off. It was a security issue. We wanted to fit, then we would have them there. We would defer to you guys on how you'd like us to do that. Okay. And I guess. Uh, let me just. Uh, so you're talking about lighting on the back of the of one six two one six four, and then the garage side of one six eight. On one six eight is the standalone. This property, correct. Okay. Right. So on the garage side, facing That's lighting correct. facing that way. Yes. On their property. <laughs> okay. okay. And Elvin, just a question is. Parking lot's not going to be over three acres, so I mean, I I just just because you put you put it on there, I just concerned me. Dust control. Some of that's just boilerplate to satisfy regulation. But it's also, like I say, it's, it's coming into fruition. It'll need to be on the plan, but it doesn't necessarily apply to the project. Correct. Right. Well, we had the issues come up out at the the, um, the Havilah place. Can't think of the name now. Oh, they were concerned Bichon? about dust uh, for the pavilion and stuff. And when I saw it on here, I just picked up dust. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any comments before I ask for a motion? site plan approval contingency on the letter from CDM Smith. CDM Smith. Now along with that, can I put a date on that? Because I hate to have this stand out for six months, three months. I'd rather I'd rather have a date. So if somebody would want to put that in a motion, I mean I guess if Jay needs to answer that he can, but I'd like to see that in some type of motion. Well, if it's ready, I'd say 30 days, because 30 days would bring us up to next month's meeting. And if you want to do 60 days, I'm okay with that. that quickly, I, just, I mean, I don't know where the CDM Smith is on workload. Well, my guess is, my guess is, and I'm not an engineer, but my guess is if they'd have been um, included on the, um, the last couple um, items. Um, and again, it, it may be in my inbox. I don't think so. But um, there's been a deluge of uh, emails of late. But I will reach out to CDM Smith tomorrow 
to make sure that Abraham and um, Brian have what they need. I'd imagine that um, provided, again, with the exempt letters from the county, um, the, um, of course, the distribution is already happening, happened, advisory approval and exempt on the um, grading. I, I would imagine that we're probably a week or so away. I'm giving 60 days, Max. Yeah. Why don't we 60 allow 60? 60 if it happens in 30, it happens in 30. Yeah. Right. We can address it and get it you right back. Get, get it back. Yeah. Consensus because on that. Because we went through this in the past, for some of you guys don't remember. Mm. Okay. So, so would somebody put that in some, and don't ask me to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> but some put that in some type of motion. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll make a motion that we accept the preliminary plan uh, described here with the uh, contingency that we receive the CD, CDM, CDM S Smith uh, paperwork within 30 days. 60. 60 days, thank you. 60 days. Is there a second to that? Second. A second by Bill. Okay, before I call for the, the vote, is there any comments from the floor? Chairman. So, um, um, <clears throat> Commissioner, you're, you're approving the pre preliminary site plan? Correct. Yes, okay. with, with a condition. With yeah, a condition. With, with yes. condition. condition approval from CDM staff. Okay. Yes. Yes. Mr. Myers made that motion. Yep, I'm good. Okay. Second my bill. Okay. Any comments from the floor? All all those in favor of that motion that was just <laughs> just announced. Can make me repeat it? No. <laughs> Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, likewise. Mm -hmm. Janelle's. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Jess. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Bill seconded, right. Okay, back to action items. Miss <coughs> Aziz. So, Jim, I may need, to be, may, be, may need to be heavily babysat here. Okay. So, my understanding was any, any hearing that went any case that went before the uh, BZA had to go in front of the planning commission first. Not that you guys had to say yay or nay, but it had to be heard. Is that that right? Right. So the planning commission needs to have the opportunity to comment okay. on any um, BZA case. Okay. Um, but they don't they, have to be here. Right. right? The, the applicant doesn't have to be here. Jade's on the screen. So. Right. In some cases, it's to their advantage to you know to make their right. case. But they're not obligated to, just as you're not obligated to make a recommendation. You just have to have the the reco the opportunity to do so. Yeah. Jay, did you have a comment that you would like to offer? That is that is accurate, um, and um, so you can make a recommendation for or against based on what the zoning administrator is telling you, because it's not testimony you're taking but the applicant must show up at the board of zoning appeals case if they do not show up at the case the case doesn't happen kind of like going to court so um there's no and the case i guess i don't know it's already been said but the case is already set for a hearing uh for next week so uh the timing the advertising and everything was on the assumption that you would or it's tomorrow sorry yeah that you would um you would make some some recommendations or not but at least it's come to you tonight Mrs. Aziz, um, um, her license was issued by the Ohio Department of Public Goods. I want to confirm it was not criminal. Um, she is using only, she's using less than 25 credit hours per day. She has documented things like um, emergency routes, a couple of different routes that she actually has merged um, and she's shown on her form. She has adequate parking for the um, um, drop off Of that there is no fence um, 
currently is not the business of Judge Bonner. But she has said that she plans on doing it. But I would not expect to be going into any advocacy of that case at this point. Is there a bench requirement? No. Just something we ask for for sake of practicality. It can be a recommendation of the bench. Is that a recommendation for us or is that for us for the Board of Appeals or is that for the Board of Appeals for them to make a recommendation for her? So it's – if you generally like the idea or feel like the fence should be required, you could make a favorable recommendation and suggest that the Board of Appeals should try to follow it. They may or may not take your recommendation or act upon it the way you want, but you can make that recommendation. Mr. Chairman, that would be the best way to go. They have always required a fence and they always make it a condition, but there isn't anyone there to suggest it unless they suggest it on their own. We have all new members, so hearing the report that Daryl will give saying the Planning Commission looked at this and recommends will certainly put that into the record so that they have something to hang their hat on. I guess our obligation basically is, is this home occupancy, child care, whatever, appropriate for the location that the house is in? Is that correct? Not necessarily her operation of it, but is, is it suitable for that location? It looks like a nice lo location. I mean, there are uh, neighbors on either side and only one neighbor to the back in the way that the lots lay. And across the street is open space. So um, there's not a whole lot of impingement on uh, comings and goings of, of their neighbors. Uh, so from that standpoint, um, it looks like a good spot. I have to agree with you as far as the, the house, the location. My concern is her operation, which may not be our issue to com comment about. My first concern was that the drawing shows a door on the one side of the garage door, an outside door to go out, which does not exist. And secondly, that I don't think I would want my child in a room in a basement with, for five days a week looking out a window that I had to look up to get out of. I mean, it, the window... Talking when the well is below ground level. The egress window? The egress window. And I can't see how that can be an egress window by fire code. And that's just me saying, not... not. Well, there is a minimum size requirement for fire code. Size I mean, is well fine. That. But that, unless you've been there, look, that window has a grate over top of it. And it's below ground level. So that means if I'm a person that's taking care of four, five, two, three-year-olds, lift them up in that window well, somehow then get them out of that window well and get them out to the backyard. I just wouldn't want my child to have to go through that. As far as the house, the house is in a good location. I think it's good for us. I'm just concerned with her operation. I don't think it should be in the basement. If she's unloading two or three kids of children in the driveway and she takes those downstairs, who's watching the downstairs while she goes up and gets the other ones? just concerned with having the children in the basement in her setting too. So, and that's my opinion based on the operation, not on if the house is suitable for- Is there no outside egress from the basement? That window. That's it. 
Yeah, that's what the whole deal was all about. Well, there's a stairwell going upstairs, but not. Well, I mean, right, I mean, right now it's just the kitchen and the garage. The kitchen, yeah. So we got a stair. I guess you really have to look at the house yourself to know what that window well looks like. The window well is ground level, so you see it's four feet down, or whatever it is. And there's my child all day looking up at a window, window light. So maybe that may not be our decision to be making. But I would hope some something like that would go to the Board of Appeals and they're concerned. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also a little bit concerned about this drawing because it's hard to read. Uh, and I really couldn't, you know, that's why, that's why I, I couldn't tell whether there's an outside egress to the basement or not. Um, you know, and if, if um, you know, it's a room listed here as a napping room. Um, you know, my understanding is that you can't have a bedroom per se in a in a basement room that in a basement that doesn't have an exterior walkout exit. And she has a note on here from the, at the main level, up like mid page, will not be used for right. childcare except for to exit the building during an emergency. Then, but her egress, is, if she uses a stairwell. Right. There again, my concern is getting those little children oh, I get outside you. and then still control six or eight kids. Jess, she also, she finished her basement after she bought the home. And that went through the Carroll County um, building process permit with the city and with the counties. So she did. So have, that window was approved for egress? Well, well I mean, that, that the question course. is, in, in her permit application, was that part of the, you know, was that noted in her application for permit that what the use was going to be? Right, to her right. That could be just a rec space. Right, right. Yeah. right. That could be just finishing off for a rec room in terms of the yeah. permit. Um, that, sir, I'm not sure. Um, so, but I mean, I'm, I'm not really inquired right now. Um, it's for a 12 year old baby. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important because what Daryl will do at the um, Board of Zoning Appeals hearing will give his report and he will relay your concerns or issues. You don't have to make them in the form of mandates because the board will decide it. But if you don't bring it up and have Daryl tell them, there is no one else that will bring it up unless they see it themselves. And that's the purpose of why we bring these things to you is you have the eye for looking at these plans where the Board of Zoning Appeals is basically like a judge hearing the testimony in front of them. So it is perfectly permissible to say, you know, we're okay with the location, but we have these concerns about the potential layout and you could bullet point them so that Daryl can express that to the board. room was made after she bought the house wasn't part of buying the house that was made into a livable space the basement was built. so went to the county got all the inspections but at that time was that the intention by her that she was going to make it a basement and when she took right, was that or was that use made clear during the permit process yes that's what I'm saying we also need to keep in mind that she still will need to go through the state to get her license okay Okay. So okay. this this is her first step because yep. she'll need to demonstrate that she has zoning approval to apply for her okay. for her license. So there's more to the process than than us. 
and I believe as far as the escape well or that you know four by four pit road coming in, that that street corner is clearly not for living space, and in particular a, a bedroom uh, to be below grade. So otherwise, it would be considered a, a bonus room or something like that. But you need that that egress window for it to be considered a, a bedroom. Brian, any comments from the floor? always in the opinion that we could give some type of recommendation that's favorable on on both not none we could give one or the other so somebody would like to make an emotion one way or the other or against the first obligation is is it appropriate for the location of the building I mean, that's, it, it would, that does kind of step beyond our bounds as to you know, whether or not it's, it's suitable for the operation. You know, it, from, a zone, from a zoning standpoint, okay. Um, yeah, so we again, if, if we make a motion, one way or the other, we need to put an explanation for it. And as, as Jay said, those, those can be done at the tail end of, of the report to the board. To have the planning commission express concerns about emergency egress uh, or question whether it looks safe for a street grade and then to to really give them to uh, to the board of appeals to consider and ask for that comment and i would want the state out here in approval to, to make an inspection and i see a false track of through and just mm -hmm. sign off on it and we're off and running you have to you have to do the best to get the So uh, um, I think our recommendation is, or our comment is that the lot is uh, suitable for a daycare uh, based on the uh, ordinance that we uh, reviewed. Um, we do have some concerns, and uh, uh, one is uh, the restricted ease of dress for the children while they're uh, uh, in the uh, daycare room. Um, I'm also concerned about the uh, supervision when the uh, daycare provider, I think they said there was only going to be one when goes upstairs to the kitchen to prepare a meal. I don't know how she can watch them when they walk downstairs. Um, we have children here in the, the kitchen in the bedroom. And uh, just picking up and dropping off children. Yep. And finally, uh, um, I would recommend that really we do a, a spec uh, and have them come back up and have a hearing on that. And uh, I think uh, we'll yeah. have some more discussion on that. Recommendation. Is there a second to that? Second. Mr. Mayor has uh, made the motion. Mr. Brown seconded it. Looking for any other discussion? I mean, I, I, we need to be clear that we are approving the, the zoning location only, um, not, the operation. not the operation, because this is, I, I have some grave concerns about this whole thing. Okay. I agree with my uh, motion. Agreed with your motion. <laughs> no, I mean, with this being yeah. amended, to be clear, to, to be clear that we are only we are only approving the zoning yep. and, and and use. And again, it's it's not an approval; it's just right. a recommendation. recommendation. And and so I think that she needs to make sure we need to make sure that she understands that also because there's a lot of process here that I'm sure she doesn't fully understand. Unless we have the okay. okay. All all those in favor of that recommendation. Unanimous. Thank you, guys. I knew that was going to be a tough one. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Ordinance none. Your report, Daryl. Okay. Um, CDM Smith and the city staff met um, the other day, uh, the 28th, to talk about tobacco and um, stormwater management. Um, <clears throat> 
Member Brooks seven is now removed. Jim, off your list of um, uh, dirty birds there on the agenda. Okay, so thank we're, you. We're, we're getting them off there, slowly but surely. Okay. Um, Let me ahead. ask you a question while you're on the uh, talking about the agenda. Is the Garland Ridge and Bean property, is that one of the same? Or is that two separate properties? The Garland Ridge is a thing and Bean is whatever. One's on one side and one's on the other side of the Havilah? Or not? No, no, no. The Bean, Garland Bean's property, what we use around the Havilah property. So what we used to refer to as the Bean property is Garnet Ridge. Okay, so it's one of the same now. Yeah, right. The gentleman used to own what's now venue Bouchon and the acreage to the east of it and then sold off what became the venue. Um, and now the residential part is known as Garnet Ridge. So, so all future is Garland Ridge. Gar Garnet. 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 Right. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Um, so your city staff, uh, as you were, um, Director Lorena um, Becare will probably most likely, um, she plans to next month present to you the um, uh, advanced plans for Memorial Park expansion. And it's moving along pretty well. It's a rather cut and dry piece of land. Um, they don't have a bunch of these pesky things called trees. And okay. Specimen tree. So um, that's, that's moving along pretty well, and that's going to be a it's going to be a gorgeous uh, facility, I'll tell you that. It's very nice. Okay. Um, so I look forward to that next month. Um, we City staff met with uh, Raronized Distillery on the south side of the um, uh, Antrim Boulevard and the Feaser property uh, to work on ways to get water and sewer to the site. Very challenging site, both sides. So more to come on that. And, sir, after that, um, that's all I have. Okay, uh, can we jump back? Where are we at with Evapco? Did they drop the whole project or are they just reconfiguring it? No, so, um, no, the, the project has not been dropped anywhere. Um, they just the redesign in the building, so we're doing too much work to spend the money looking to talk about a, um, a, a area. A height so variance, wasn't it? Uh, was yeah. it a height variance yes. of the building? Yes. So, and then they um, contact the city for the upcoming alternate site that they just announced. I haven't really seen that yet, but no, that it's the way it is with that. Okay. Legal report, Jay. Hello, Jay. Uh, my camera will come on here. There we go. So um, if you follow the city council, you will see that there is going to be an ordinance uh, on the agenda coming up at their next set of meetings which looks like the ordinance that you just dealt with with the townhomes, the one that Councilman Tillman was talking about. And it is the exact same ordinance uh, with a couple minor changes because we found some technical amendments, uh, especially considering the fact that we say townhome, but that also is multifamily home. And I mean, there's all sorts of different ways to say it. So uh, the city manager and I thought that it would be best to have a technical amendment and technical amendments of that nature don't come back before you and don't require another public hearing. So uh, we anticipate that's gonna pass and then resolve the matter uh, once and for all. Of course, we need to change the definition section and uh, to create the definitions for these properly. So there is once and for all what it is. And that will come back before you and we'll have a public hearing and everything, but it's all part of the package and all directed at the uh, Mountain Brook Development Community Village stuff that we just talked about. So um, not anything surprising. So that's, if you come to the meeting, that's what you'll see. And that's all we really have on your front going on. Thank you, Jay. Okay, now city, county, quick notes. I'm gonna keep it tonight. Um, so the water sewer master plan triennial update gone to Maryland Department of Environment for approval. Everything still remains the same for the previous um, cycle in the fall uh, until MDE approves that. And then um, there will be no 2023 fall amendment to it. So that's no, nothing planned anyway. Um, the 
Transportation Master Plan is still getting worked on and being reviewed by the County um, Zoning Commission of Cook County. The Economic Development and Land Use Study is being finalized and should go before the Planning Commission either um, at the end of next month, the end of August, or the beginning of September. And Director Linda Eisenberg has left the department, and our new acting um, director is Patricia Herman. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Old business? New business? Nope. Okay. Um, have the commission members received anything about the October, I think it was October conference? No. Okay. Getting something very soon. I mean, it's something very well that goes to. I think it's October. Isn't it October? Yes. Yeah. 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 Commission yeah. members yeah. and yeah. board of patrol members. Yeah. 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 It's Ken Allen, I think. I think Ken Allen. September 25th, does that look like the next date? No holidays, right? August 28th. No. Oh, yeah. September 25th, right? This is our next meeting, right? No, August. Oh, August. August. Yeah. Is that next month? It is the month. All right. It's in school July. Ah, okay. Oh, wow, it's in school July. Okay, so what is it in August then? August 28th. August 28th, okay, thank you. I might not have been here. Make a motion by Brown, second by. I'll second that. Second by Chris. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It's over. Thank you. Thank you.